Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, members of the panel. I'm sure that when we had the invitation for me to come to speak with you tonight, we were promised that we would be legless afterwards. I didn't think that I'd have to be legless before I got here. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this is indeed one of those epochal times that we have in our lives. You are living in a period of history that not only will you remember, but also will your children remember because you will be able to pass it down to them. And in the debates that you've heard before the referendum, during the referendum, and even post the referendum, we have heard the virulent arguments for and against. We've heard the temper of those arguments. Those who are passionate, like myself, who believe that we have a bright future outside of the European Union for you in particular, as young people, to look upon the world rather than 27 other nations. But there are those like Anna and Lord Adonis and Tim who have a different view, a view that I believe is in the past. Take this phone. This phone that I now look at, when I leave here, I can make a phone call and talk to my daughter. I can see her visually on it. Only 20 or 30 years ago, you would have to have a brick on your shoulder a Motorola. You might have even then progressed onto a Nokia, which suddenly went out of business and then tried to refocus itself. The European Union, in my view, is the Motorola of the past, the Nokia of the past, the future that Britain lies ahead of us, with a free trade agreement with other countries, including the European Union, is the Samsung and the Apple of the future, and you should embrace it. Now, there are a number of things in this debate that I often regret, and yes, tone is one of the important aspects about it. And I, I, I think, Anna, I know you made a comment about us being bastards and, and a bastard and a bugger. Uh -huh. I didn't realise that you knew that I was the former, but I've never done the latter. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, my mother was one of those white, working class mothers who grew up in Moss Side in Manchester, who went to bed with a black man, my father. Now here they produced me as the firstborn in the 60s, one of those who were mixed race now. But we had different names then. Oh yes, we were called niggers. Yes, we were called half-breeds. Yes, we were called half-castes. Unfortunately now, I faded like Michael Jackson, but naturally. <laughs> but my brothers, Michael and Nathan, retained the colours. And like so many in the Bain community, we did not fear Lord Adonis leaving the European Union on a question of racism. We voted on something stronger than that. We voted on our history and culture, and indeed, the things that make this Britain proud. Freedom. Seven letters. F-O-E-E-D-O-M. It's been some great songs in the past, of course, but it's important matters that we looked at. And why do I believe freedom matters more? Because I used to look at my grandfather, who sat in the chair in our house and would sometimes lonely get up with his own memories and thoughts inside his head and go to the pub, the Green End, in Burnage. And he'd have a whiskey, and he'd sit there alone. And I knew from my grandmother what he was thinking about. He was thinking about the people he lost in the Second World War, those who died alongside him, those who were murdered in that great war, those who the European Union, I agree, came together to try and stop, so that we didn't have those lines that you heard from Robert Graves, that, don't re uh, that if I should die, think of me, that some corner is forever England. He never wanted that. And I welcome the European Union's formation to try and prevent war in the future. But there was also something else that came from that, a forgetfulness of the European Union. How the Commonwealth, how millions of people from India and Pakistan, from the West Indies came together to fight alongside those of the United States and Britain to take on the terrors of Germany so that we could have freedom across the European Union. Now, during the referendum debate, I was on the Daily Politics show with the MP, the Labour MP,
David Lammy. And during the course of that debate, we discussed the numbers of Indians who'd fought alongside our British soldiers in that Second World War. And he made a comment that I think was quite profound about those who believe in the European Union. He said those soldiers died from India for the European project. Think about it, the European project. They died for the European project. Well, the only European project at that time was Hitler's, who tried to subdue all people into one nation state. A European project that wanted to kill Jews and Romans and those who were disabled. Well, the European project, maybe alongside his thinking of David Lammy, is perhaps that Jeff Hurst scored three goals in the World Cup for the European project. Maybe we landed on the moon for the European project. Maybe Marilyn Monroe's skirt flew up for the European project. But that level of zeal to support the European <coughs> Union is something that lies deep in those who cannot see far ahead of themselves of the future that holds for ourselves. Freedom, liberty, democracy, they roll off our tongue so easily that we almost forget how we got it. It was fought for and people died for it, and you must maintain it. But the revolutionary zeal for freedom came at a cost in this country. From the levellers and the diggers, to the chartists, to the Pentridge martyrs, who all at their time sought to defeat those in government, those elites, to eke out small aspects of freedom in their lives. Parliamentary democracy, the ability to have those good persons and 12 vote for, uh, uh, be able to take us in courts, to be able to have the vote to change our lives. And it is that vote that matters, the vote that enabled parties to put into place a free education that someone like myself could go to a council house, to a school, to become educated so that I could go to a university and receive a grant that many of you no longer get. So that I too could be looked after by the National Health Service. So that housing was created so that we'd have a council house to live in. All of them were done by the vote by our people and note all of it before the European Union. Now, William Pitt the Elder, the great commoner, once said that the poorest man in his cottage may bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. Well, I would say that the second referendum, yes, it concerned immigration. Yes, it concerned aspects of trade and the economy. But it also concerned the continuation of that revolutionary zeal to ensure that the elites, whoever you may think they are, and I think I know who they are, are actually brought low and understand that you matter more than they. And that is why I believe that we should continue this continuation of zeal. I'm shocked and stunned to a certain extent that I go to universities across the country where so many of our young people, instead of being out there questioning those in power, questioning why they are doing the things they are, Questioning why there is 50% youth unemployment in Greece, 32% youth unemployment in Croatia, 46% youth unemployment in Italy during the European Union. Question what Adonis has said, what Adonis has said, about why we have poverty and left behind people here in the United Kingdom whilst we're a member of the European Union. Because for all of you live in a gilded cage of good fortune. Most of you will not have the lack of opportunities these people do, you will be able to move on and seek better opportunities. And that is why you should be the people out there fighting alongside them to recognise their importance and recognise their need to be listened to rather than shouted down. James said that he went off to Glastonbury on the day after the vote. In Glastonbury, on the day after the vote, there were people proudly dancing around the sign saying the old must die. Are we the ones that said that we started this kind of fraction 
a division in our society? No. It was there all along, but for some reason, some reason, the young people feel it's good to attack the old. Those who were old then were young when the initial vote went on. In 1972, when they voted, they were looking to a European economic community, not a political union, which Professor Tim has suggested, and will happen. So I will say to you this, in my last minute, before I go. On the eve of the attack in Quebec, General Wolfe said to his soldiers in the 1751, he gave them a poem by Thomas Gray, and in that poem, he had said to his troops that he would rather be the poet than win against the French. And it was this. Let not ambition mock those you, their useful toil, their homely joy and destiny obscure, nor grandeur here with a disdainful smile the short and simple annals of the poor. I do not regret Brexit, ladies and gentlemen, or this referendum because it was a chance for the people of the North, the people that I came from, the constituencies I lived in, who finally said, we have had enough of being told what to do by you who just scrape a few coins off the table to the rest of us. And you as the young people of the future should recognize your stand in their future, defend their rights to have that vote and defend their rights to be heard. And if you don't, shame on you.